thank you for all attending, especially after um, the success of the Euros. So <laughs> I'm happy that you've come. Um, so just to go through um, a welcome to our first Gecko classroom before we start some housekeeping rules. Um, please keep your microphones on mute during the presentations um, and until you've been chosen in the live chats if you have any questions. Um, we encourage participating, so please um, raise your hand via the chat function or write some notes in the chat um, at the side um, and we'll get round to you when we can with our facilitator. Um, this event's only made better by all your varied opinions and experiences that you will provide. So, um, and if you do fall out, just rejoin. So you may be readmitted a few minutes later. Um, so thank you for coming again. Um, just a little intro, um, quickly introduce myself. I'm Jessica Gray. I'm one of the uh, current junior emergency medicine doctors at Leeds Teaching Hospitals. And I have an interest in global healthcare systems, particularly outside of my kind of sheltered experience within the NHS. Um, throughout this year, my supervisor Najib Rahman has directed me towards the Royal College of Emergency Medicine Framework for Global Emergency Medicine Fellows. Um, and this has really been what shaped the focus of our classrooms. Um, we've also been fortunate enough to be introduced to Anissa Jafar and the Global Emergency Care Collaborative Gecko. And this is an open platform for multidisciplinary professionals who have an interest in emergency care and global health. And that's at whatever stage of career and whatever level of experience. Um, so this classroom's concept is a bit of a birth child of myself and Beth Fenby Hodgson, who's another fellow EM colleague at Leeds Teaching Hospitals with an interest in public health. And this event wouldn't have been run well enough without the support of our Gecko team member and Leeds nursing colleague, Rosa Gallup, who we'll meet later. So following the presentation, we'll encourage some discussion about the 2019 paper that was shared a little bit earlier. And um, this is not a journal club, don't worry, but we thought it'd be useful to apply what we've learned. Um, and find out about the benefits of, of research in EM, but also the obstacles that are faced in reality. And then fortunately, later on, we are going to be joined um, by one of the authors, Janaid Razak, who will be talking a bit later as well. So as mentioned before, this is a four part series over the next year, following the guidance of this fellowship framework. This is our first session, which will focus on global disease burden and how this knowledge is part of foundation of the understanding of demands, particularly faced by emergency care systems globally. So the learning outcomes will be to be aware of global development goals and to understand what burden of disease is, to be aware of the global burden of disease study, understand why this is relevant to emergency medicine, and hopefully then discuss some of the ups and downs of research in global emergency medicine. So if you go back to the 2000s, when the UN Millennium Declaration resulted from all member states agreeing to achieve the eight global goals by 2015, um, you may be aware of them already, or all um, indirectly impact health, but three specifically are health related. Um, number four, to reduce under five mortality by two thirds. Number five, reduce the mater maternal mortality ratio by three quarters. And number six, to halt and reverse the spread of HIV, AIDS and incidence of malaria and other diseases such as TB, all by 2015. Um, in 2005, the World Health um, Assembly resolution called for all countries to transition to this universal health coverage. Um, so universal health coverage is ha um, all people having access to health services without being exposed to financial hardship. And that is defined as a household having to spend over 10% of their um, income on health care. In, in 2015, 32% um, of health expenditure came from out-of-pocket payments. And in 2007, this was over 50% uh, globally. So obviously it's improving, the percentage is improving, but they're still too high for a lot of households. And this puts them at risk of what we class as, as catastrophic um, spending, and that would be if over 25% of a, of a household's income is spent on health, spent on health expenditure. Um, and worst case scenario may push them into an impoverishing expenditure. And this is when a household has been pushed into poverty due to the expenditure on health. Um, and in 2015, unfortunately, nearly 90 million were pushed into extreme poverty just purely due to out-of-pocket payments on health. Um, so achieve, to achieve universal healthcare, there are three dimensions that are, are usually considered. That's the services, the financing, and then the population that's being covered. So here is a current um, pooled funds. This depicts hypothetically a country um, where about half of the population is covered for about half the possible services and where less than half of the cost of these services is met from these pooled funds. So as you can predict, the more services you try to cover, potentially the less population that's covered and definitely the less um, funds that can be pooled to contribute towards it um, as there's a finite, finite amount. 
Um, and just a quick example of that. So um, in the 1990s, there was community-based health insurance that had been promoted in low-income countries to reduce the financial burden of accessing healthcare. Um, there's very low enrollment in sub-Saharan African countries, whereas Rwanda was a very successful exception to that. In 1919, this health insurance was introduced and initially had quite a good uptake and a good surge in, in um, people signing up, but still very much marginalised a large proportion of people due to the scheme's premiums. Um, so in 2006, funding from global funds allowed premiums to be covered instead of directly putting it to disease specific interventions like tu tuberculosis interventions that they usually would do. Um, they did a very uh, horizontal coverage and covered all all the premiums or at least subsidize them for most which meant the government could then enforce mandatory health insurance so now in the last few years it's believed that over 80 percent of those living in rwanda have health insurance cover and this is correlated with an increased utilization of health services um, so rwanda is currently the most advanced country in the continent to um, be achieving universal health coverage obviously sustainability is still a question there's still a lot of work to be done but it's really promising to see an example like that so if you move on to the Sustainable Development Goals in 2012 in Rio, um, the UN conference um, tried to follow on this momentum of the MDGs and they decided on 17 new goals that were proposed with an agenda spanning until 2030 and specifically wanted to include universal health coverage. So at this point you might be starting to think how is this even measured or how do we know if we're even achieving these goals? Um, so the Sustainable Development Goals Index is based off some performance indicators and they're measured um, and based off data collected from the Global Disease Burden Study. So you're starting to probably see some relevance now. And even though we've not covered all key points, just to fact, cover one chronological point in 2018, so the role of emergency care in reaching these development goals and universal health coverage has become increasingly recognised. And in 2018, a five-year plan was approved called the Triple Billion Goal, um, which essentially aimed for 1 billion more people to have universal health coverage without that financial hardship that we mentioned, protection from health emergencies and better health and well-being. And this would be based off the um, sustainable development goal indicators like suicide, mortality, um, water sanitation, etc. And as the picture depicts as well, it's clear to achieve universal health coverage and well-being, protection from health emergencies is equally important and therefore um, strong emergency care systems. So if we go on to what actually is the burden of disease, it's mortality and morbidity due to disease, injury and risk factors of disease. And this is a concept that was developed by the World Health Organization, World Bank and Harvard in the 1990s. And this was just to, to try and quantify that gap between reality and the ideal of living a life free of disease and disability. And if you're not convinced already, why is it so important to measure? So a large proportion of debilitating disease or its causative factors are preventable. So we, this is only just one example, 45% of deaths under fives is linked to undernutrition. But there's several other facts of millions of lives attributable to tobacco use, um, physical um, insufficiency of activity, um, salt intake, etc. And obviously measurement is necessary because you need to prioritise the resources, the finite resources to formulate health policies, to monitor progress such as the development goals and to assess whether interventions that we've actually put in are actually working in the first place. And how is this measured? So a disability adjusted life year is years um, living with disability plus years lost um, prematurely um, due to that disability. Um, so this is a metric that was introduced in the 1990s when they decided to measure disease in, in the first place, disease burden in the first place. And this has been continuously revised um, most recently in 2016. So initially they actually felt that years in the future um, of good health weren't actually as valuable as the years in the present. And the same with years as being an infant or at old age was again, not as valuable as years as a young adult. So this has now been scrapped and, uh, and it's been recognized that good health at any, any age is, is um, equal to each other and equally as valuable. And there were also new disability weights introduced. So initially this was decided by just healthcare professionals many who probably never had experienced the disability or the disease themselves. So they started to ask the general public and individuals who'd experienced these disabilities and the diseases. And with some lay descriptions, got them to try and compare two health states to see whether they felt one was healthier or less sick than another. And then collated all this to make a spectrum with zero being perfect health and one being equivalent to death. And these weights were then used multiplied by the years to create 
um, years living with disability and then added to the years of life lost and this created a DALI. So this was used for the Global Burden of Disease study, which in 1990s was the largest kind of study of its, of its kind attempted really, um, and was an, a systematic effort to try and quantify this loss of health um, by age, sex and geographies. And this was achieved by collecting data from all sorts of formal archives um, and has grown quite considerably since. So in 1990s studied only 100 diseases, but the number of diseases and um, injuries has increased as well as introducing risk factors in 2005. Um, and since then, the collaborators by 2017 had been over 3,000 and over 300 disease and injuries and, and covering over almost 200 countries and territories. So, as you can imagine, initially the predominant focus of health, global health initiatives was to reduce mortality. And this was predominantly how global health progress was tracked. So, as you can see, there's been a huge improvement in life expectancy over this period of time. Um, particularly in under fives mortality. And these, these biggest reductions are actually seen in the lower socio-demographic countries. Um, and then following the initiative of the Millennium Development Goals, there has been a significant improvement in communicable diseases as well as maternal and neonatal health from 1990s. Um, this is due to several factors, obviously, other than the funding, so improved nutrition, improved access to healthcare, etc. But this improved access to healthcare has actually seen since 2007 a significant increase in diseases and disorders associated with antibiotic resistance, like multi drug resistant um, TB and C. diff diarrhea. And interestingly, you can see that actually there's increased mortality with cardiovascular disease. Um, despite the fact that there's been introductions of management like antihypertensives and statins that have led to a significant increase in people actually living longer in this chronic state of health. So then if we move to the um, years living with disability, this has increased by over 50%. And the majority of this has been non-communicable diseases, so not transmissible diseases. And as this proportion has increased, the proportion of communicable diseases has decreased. Interestingly, though, um, disabilities such as back pain and headaches have remained quite high, and this is likely just to the fact that there's little research in that, so not, not much has changed because not much has been looked into. Um, and as you can guess, there's significant disparities between different sexes, so females tend to live longer, um, but with a variable number of years spent in, in a state of poor health. Um, and there's also differences seen between different socio-demographic um, countries. So just a side note, these, this index is, is judged based off an average of rankings of income per person, education attainment and fertility rates. Um, and as you can see, the leading causes of premature death and disability in lower socio-demographic countries remains to be neonatal disorders and communicable diseases. Um, however, in higher socio-demographic regions, non-communicable diseases are mostly prevalent. And then in 2005, like I said, risk factors were introduced and they looked back at the 1990s as well. So we managed to collate all the evidence to compare um, how things have changed. So as we can see in the 1990s, neonatal risk factors and malnutrition were the leading factors despite it being for all age DALIs. Um, and as you can see with the leading risk factors in 2017 and the table looking at association of risk factor prevalence with the evolving, evolving socio-demographics, there's an increase in factors that are arguably seen with increasing disposable income per person um, and a decrease in risk factors such as unsafe sanitation and air pollution as a country's infrastructure evolves. So most importantly for this talk, why is it relevant to emergency medicine? So disease and disability requiring emergency care contributed to over half of all deaths globally and injuries particularly in lower income countries with developing road infrastructure can contribute to a large proportion of burden Road traffic accidents was the largest contributor to mortality for people between five to 29 years. Um, and uh, the burden of emergency medicine diseases remains higher in low income countries than non emergency medicine diseases. However, though, if you think of the populations as they age and are seen to have increasing burden from disability and disease, there's increased likelihood of complications and acute decompensations. So, therefore, more likelihood of more emergency care presentations. And most importantly to some, um, emergency care is often the first point of contact for those that either don't have easy access to primary health care, but also just health care in general. And uh, an emergency physician plays a large role in preventative medicine and acts as a public health advocate, um, especially to those who are most vulnerable in society. So if, to consider that more than 3% of the world's population have migrated from their country of origin, with over a quarter being forcibly displaced, 
this is a group that are very much vulnerable to accessing healthcare. And um, if we acknowledge the need for high quality emergency care in regards to achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 3, which is for healthy lives and promoting well-being, there's also an importance of EM in, in achieving 11 and 16. And this is sustainable cities and communities, as well as peace, justice and strong institutions. So an essential part of healthcare systems is the ability to recognise acutely ill patients in a timely manner. And it's this timeliness that's an essential a component of judging quality and death and long-term disability for millions would have been prevented if they had access to emergency care systems. Also having a well-integrated emergency care system can save lives and lack of organisation of this and, and delivery of this can lead to discrepancies in outcomes. Obviously it's recognised that there's lack of data available in emergency medicine at the moment, which is a huge obstacle in effective policy making. And lastly, as mentioned with the Sustainable Development Goals 11 and 16, when a system is overwhelmed by an occurrence of an acute event, whether that be war, natural disaster, or even a pandemic, um, there is not only mortality and morbidity due to the acute event, but also an increase in preventable death and disability from common presentations, um, which is known as secondary mortality. So now it's not really um, able to be avoided, but unfortunately there's been um, a huge impact because of COVID-19 on um, countries around the world. So due to unprecedented pressures um, that's had on populations, um, health set care systems have really struggled um, alongside the unpredictable onslaught that has been natural disasters, warfare and political unrest. And unfortunately, there's been also a vaccine monopoly um, and clear discrepancies in mass population coverage between high income and low income countries. For example, by mid-May, only approximately 2% of the population of India um, had received both vaccines, despite being a country that provides up to 80% of the world's vaccines. And just to finish on a, on a quote that really resonated with me during my reading by Dr. Terry Reynolds, who is an emergency medicine physician and was the first appointed in emergency medicine for World Health Organization. Um, and I think this is very much an assumption by many who are privileged enough to have an, an easily accessible emergency care system. So just to have a look at the impact of, of COVID-19 quickly. Um, so it was a unique opportunity actually to highlight the need for emergency care systems and actually the lack of resources and accessibility. And subsequently there was an injection of quite a large amount of funding. So the World Bank in April 2020 um, contributed 160 billion US dollars to, to countries, including Ethiopia, who got 80 million US dollars, which helped support their already existing centers. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it can be argued that they've been quite blinkered and it's very focused on only respiratory distress. So obviously there are still areas of, of emergency care that have been lacking. Um, uh, and by, uh, by 2018, 121 countries had actually already achieved the under five mortality target set um, for 2030. But unfortunately, it's been predicted that these disruptions might cause an increase of up to 45% in under five deaths per month in low to middle income countries. There's been a, a, a loss of progress with other communicable diseases. So an example would be in HIV, there's predictive modeling that with disruption for only six months, there'll be an additional 500,000 deaths in one year. Um, and the disruption to campaigns and services in, in the treatment and prevention of malaria, um, there is predicted that the deaths may double from 2018, um, which so the numbers in sub-Saharan Africa alone will be higher than the peak numbers were in 2000. And lastly, as we've probably noticed in our own uh, hospitals, it's highlighted a shortage of healthcare professionals um, and particularly their burden on women. So over three quarters of uh, doctors and nurses combined in the world are female, but they are quite um, underrepresented in managerial roles. Um, and 40% of all countries have less than 10 doctors per 10,000 people, and over half have less than 40 nurses per 10,000 people. So it's predicted that additional 18 million health workers are needed to achieve universal health coverage by 2030. So just to summarise the overload that I've given you, um, the first global bur burden of disease study in the 1990s was revolutionary with its health data collection and has since broadened its scope. And we've seen an overall positive trend in achieving most of the development goals. Um, and hopefully if you didn't know prior today, you now have a better understanding of how burden impacts um, universal health coverage and the development goals. 
I'm sure many of you personally recognise the importance of emergency medicine, but hopefully you now understand the large proportion of burden that's actually managed by emergency care systems, and you also recognise the need for further research. Emergency medicine is actually a relatively new discipline, discipline, so there's definitely room to develop. Only in 2018 did Denmark actually recognise emergency medicine as a specialty. So even countries that have established emergency care systems have a long way to go. And unfortunately, some of the work that's been done, uh, achieved already towards universal health coverage will have been undone due to the current pressures of this year. I'll just put you onto a slide of some of my resources that I use, especially if you're a visual learner like myself. There's some um, interactive visual de depictations of the summaries found, um, and also at the bottom, World Mapper that uses cartograms. So this is a cartogram showing the example of COVID-19 mortality um, related to the countries and, and the burden to each countries. But you can also find things like tweets by Donald Trump um, if you're interested. So thank you so much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. Um, I think just because I'm conscious of time, um, I'll pass on to Rosa to now commence the paper discussion um, and facilitate the rest of the session. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, my name is Rosa. I'll be hosting the second part of this evening. So this is a discussion on our chosen paper. Um, the title, as you can see on the screen, Global, Regional and National Burden of Emergency Medical Disease Aids Using Specific Emergency Disease Indicators, the Analysis of the 2015 Global Burden of Disease Study. Um, hopefully you'll have had a chance to read over or categorise the evidence patient, um, paper prior to the session. But if you haven't, don't worry, um, this paper um, ties in really nicely with the presentation that we just heard from Jess. So the aim of this part of the session is to have a very short discussion um, surrounding sort of the themes that have emerged as we've read this paper. Um, as mentioned before, um, please remain on mute unless you'd like to to say something then if you would just raise your hand using the function in the chat or put a couple of asterisks in the chat so I can identify you and then put your camera on and I'll pick you to answer a question. Um, so what am I going to say next? Um, we might not have time to get through all the questions but we are joined tonight by one of the authors of this paper Dr Janaid Razak and there will be another opportunity at the end to ask him a few questions um, to himself personally. Uh, on this screen at the minute there is currently the abstract for this paper if you'd like to have a read through but I'm going to very briefly summarise the aim of the paper. So the aim of this paper was to present two new indicators for the uniform measurement of the burden of emergency care at a national, regional and global level as a comparison between low to middle income countries and also high income countries. This had an aim to influence and impact the future health system policies in various countries as well. So to start things off, if anyone is brave enough, um, was there anything in particular that people found interesting in regards to some of this patient's um, patients findings. Yes, Najib, hello. Hi, um, <laughs> so, I mean, I think for me, um, you know, again, for me, this paper is really important again, and, and I think Jesse did a fantastic job of just taking through this journey of beginning to get your head round of why we need to understand emergency disease burden. Because, you know, until recently, or those of us who've kind of been in, in hospitals overseas and seen what comes to the door, we recognize that often the attention has been on other areas of the healthcare system and often has not focused or emphasized on emergency care. And there was that one slide that you put up just which talked about, you know, why do we need to have a metric? Why do we need to measure this? And, you know, for me, this was a, a great example of bringing those two connections together saying, how do we start to advocate for um, emergency care? And in order to do that, you need to know what you're measuring. So, so this paper, you know, for me began to kind of really put that conversation to the forefront. One thing I did find interesting, what, and you know, hopefully Junaid can kind of share his insights and how these things have evolved later on, was they specifically looked, you know, they specifically looked at diseases that they genuinely thought were emergency conditions and excluded those that might deteriorate into becoming emergency problems later on. And as, as you know, we all know here in our countries here, a lot of what we see is not just critical illness and injury, but also include a deterioration of chronic diseases or primary care kind of stuff, which is also a burden within an emergency department. And that's the one thing, you know, it would be nice to understand how things have moved on uh, in terms of recognizing pure ED burden versus 
actually you know service utility and crowding and other things so uh, yeah. yeah absolutely thanks Najib um, I've just seen that Jess has popped a little message in the chat so I'll hand over to her as well just to answer that I was just going to say that um that was exactly the same point that I was going to bring up Najib is that I think from great minds yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from our experience um in an emergency department actually if you if you look at the supplementary information of what's been classed as an emergency medical disease in this paper um, it's obviously going to have to be quite limited because you don't want to overestimate the burden with what they said in the paper but actually so many of those that weren't included like you said have those those complications or decompensations and actually is a large proportion i think of of our departments anyway, so asthmatic, so alcohol disorders, drug overdoses, large proportion of our, our attendances wouldn't be included in this burden. Um, and I think that actually potentially suggests that it's not been overestimated um, yet, but it's probably been underestimated in a lot of um, emergency care systems, especially in the UK anyway. Um, um, but I, I just thought one of the other points as well that was interesting is actually that um, as you see an emergency care system develop, you see the utilisation increase. Um, and now obviously we're in that situation where we're actually overwhelmed by utilisation. And how do we make that next step really of developing an emergency care system to make it advanced enough that actually the numbers drop again and people are using a healthcare system appropriately? Uh, I'd like if possible to bring in a couple of colleagues who I've seen that are on here. So one's Rich Lousby, if he's there and the other one is Shweta. The, the reason being is, you know, you mentioned Rwanda as part of your presentation, and I, you know, I could share some examples of how working in a teaching hospital in Rwanda, you know, worked within both the insurance system and also in terms of referrals, but it'd be good to get some perspectives from other countries. And I know that Rich Nasby's, you know, worked in Sierra Leone before. And I wonder if, if he'd be willing to share a little bit of his experience of what it was like, you know, from the context of working in a, in a hospital in Sierra Leone and the concepts around disease burden uh, and and service utilization and if rich i don't know if you're there or not i thought you were there there you are hi najib um i'm uh, actually just calling from from a, a middle of a clinical area at work so i'm i'm gonna have to sort of keep quiet i'm afraid so, so in yeah. which case i'll i'll transfer quickly to shweta, shweta <laughs> hopefully shweta's not in clinical hi. in which case <laughs> no, your perspective from india or, or other places for that matter as well. Just this kind of concept of disease burden and developing settings. Yeah, it's really, uh, thanks uh, for including me. Um, it, it's really interesting, um, the interplay between the way in which a health system is set up and also the, and therefore the usage within the emergency department and, and definitely a direct relationship with, uh, uh, you know, emergencies in general. So in India has a very sort of mixed healthcare system with the public funded healthcare system which is largely underfunded um, and then there's um, you know a private health system but essentially overall the out-of-pocket expenditure is up to 70 to 80 percent for individuals and insurance is kind of picking up a bit but there's still a big out-of-pocket expenditure and this means that for across the entire health system which means that um, you know people are reluctant to use services uh, for preventive uh, reasons and therefore there's an escalation of use in, of emergency uh, services because things have escalated and, and people have reached an emergency situation. Um, so in that context, the, the interplay between the way a health system is uh, funded um, has a kind of direct relationship in, you know, in both emergency service usage uh, and also the disease burden. Um, and certainly what Jessica sort of mentioned is very true in India in terms of uh, injuries and accidents. As you see, the, as you see India has, um, you know, a lot of investment um, and sort of economic growth. There's infrastructure development and with that comes a big burden of, um, of um, injuries, uh, which is significantly growing. So um, just, a, you know, my two bits about that kind of interplay within the health system. Um, and uh, emergency service usage and the kind of disease we see. Oh, cool. Thanks, Shatra, for that. And I, I think if I would just reflect a little bit on contrasting how it was in Rwanda. So in Rwanda, in, in the main you know, teaching hospital, Kigali University Teaching Hospital, it's considered a referral hospital. So you, you couldn't get into the department unless you had been referred via a district hospital, 
or via one of the pre-hospital services that were based in the city. And pre-hospital coverage was still developing. So most of our patients came, you know, they had to go to another hospital first, be managed there, and then transferred across. And so there was already a barrier to transfer because of who was the clinician in the district hospital, were they making an early decision, and what were the financial barriers to transport before they got to us? Um, with the insurance system, I, if I can remember correctly, patients still had to pay up to 10% of costs. So, you know, a CT scan of a head would cost about $50. So therefore, they would have to put upfront costs at $5 for a CT scan. But for most of that, you know, this was un you know, unaffordable for a lot of the patients that attended. So even when they came and got transferred across to the ED, then there was again barriers and delays to treatment, particularly for, for injured patients. I think what was interesting over the time scale of our program in Rwanda for the residency program there is that beginning to measure what constituted emergency care business was important in starting to advocate and lobby for changes, such as a waiver of uh, you know, the insurance premium, uh, sorry, the insurance uh, fees, or the, rather the out of pocket fees in emergency context and that it would be reclaimed afterwards. So having, having some kind of quantifiable measure of what we were seeing was really important. And I think, I don't know whether other countries or, or hospitals are using this concept of EMDs uh, and disease burden, whether it, it helps guide policy funding and, and things. I wonder if there's no more sort of points to finish off what, what you said, Najib, and thanks very much for that. Um, whether just for the last few minutes of this sort of paper-based discussion, um, we could perhaps talk about the limitations. Like, and I think we have touched on it a little bit of using sort of a, a measure as discussed in the paper um, and sort of discuss around sort of the use of dallies and things like that, just to sort of tie it back in. But thanks very much for that. And I wonder if anyone has anything to say surrounding sort of the use of the measures that were used in the paper. And I might have to pick on Beth for this bit because I know she has quite interesting points about it. Thanks, Beth. Yeah, so I think um, it, it is touched on in the paper is this idea of actually data collection. Um, and we know that obviously for burden of disease, the data that we collect for it, we need it to be representative of the true burden of disease. Um, but there are limitations with it. And I think it's interesting to consider things like diagnostics. So we all, you know, we try and practice evidence-based medicine as much as possible, but there is still a subjective element sometimes to diagnosis. So you need an accurate diagnosis, firstly. You need to have a system that can actually collate the data, somewhere to record it, somewhere to store it safely, somewhere to then be able to access it, to then be able to utilise the data in the future as well. Um, and I think it's maybe maybe something that we maybe take for granted a little bit, especially in the NHS, where it's it's quite ingrained in our practice and we have, you know, there's, there's constant data collection all the time. But actually, considering that it is a little bit more challenging in certain parts of the world, even things like if you have paper records and then you end up with you know, damp, mould, fires, any of that, and it's all lost. Um, and I know it's the, there has been there has been some look at the the global burden of disease study and that has been discussed quite in depth as well but i don't know if anyone has any kind of particular experiences with with data collection in kind of more challenging areas of the world at all i think um anisa's just raised her hand or said something in the chat so i'll hand over to anisa yeah, I feel a bit guilty probably not saying anything, given that I spent three years with a PhD looking at um, documentation, data collection and disasters. <laughs> I would definitely get called out and the G would pick me out. Um, but I was actually going to make more of a comment, uh, just even based on UK practice, because obviously the, the start point about what, what we actually input and what gets read as, as the, the diagnosis or the investigations very often relies on our own coding and anyone who has to do that um, particularly in the emergency department I know obviously work has been done over the past few years to try and make this a little bit more streamlined but you know we all know that speed is of the essence um, and unless things are straightforward simple um, reachable we very often just speed to our own coding perhaps because many of us 
don't necessarily think about or have experience of what that actually means because if we don't do something accurate at the very beginning obviously you know one inaccuracy doesn't make a difference but if we're all making um you know constantly inaccurate um, written down diagnoses this is going to impact on the way that health systems ultimately get funded so if we don't pay attention to what we actually do as clinicians on the ground and try and get this as right as possible this is the kind of health intelligence that then feeds into you know the bigger bigger systems and then the kind of public health um, side of things so we do have a huge responsibility but because it's so fragmented and very often reliant on what we do as individuals it can get quite lost and I think a lot of ownership um, does need to be sort of ingrained in departments and particularly from a leadership point of view the real importance you know if we want to advocate for funding to advocate you know we, re we really need more of this resource that we, we need to be making sure that other people understand the work we've actually done and, and, and the, the things that we've actually seen in the department in a very accurate way um, so that really did make me you know reflect on that and obviously in disaster settings um you know you, you don't need to do a PhD in, in that topic to imagine that if documentation is a problem um, in um, you know a well-developed healthcare system or an you know a less well-developed healthcare system if you stick a disaster on top of that then you know things get even worse um, but that's that was the main point I wanted to make thank you for inviting me in or allowing me to avoid being pulled in by somebody. Thanks, Anissa. Um, I'd love to continue the discussion because I think there's some really interesting points there, but I'm actually going to hand over to the main man here who's just joined us. Um, and thank you for everyone that has contributed to that part of the session. Um, for the final part of the session this evening, we are joined by Dr. Janaid Vazak, who joins here tonight from Baltimore. So Good evening or good afternoon. I'm not really sure what it is. I don't think it's evening for you though, is it? Uh, so just a quick introduction. So Dr. Razak is the director of the John Hopkins Center for Global Emergency Care and professor of emergency medicine. Previously, Dr. Razak served as professor um, at the, oh, sorry, I've lost where I am, served as the professor and founding chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Aga Khan University and continues his leadership role at the Aga Khan University Centre of Excellence for Trauma and Emergencies. He will soon be moving to New York from Baltimore as vice chair of research in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Vail Cornell Medical College. So I will go and hand over to Janaid now, who's going to do a short presentation and then followed by some questions at the end. Sure, thank you for the introduction and thanks uh, Najib and, uh, and colleagues for the invitation. Uh, it's really uh, uh, what you guys are talking about is such an important area and we have, many of us have struggled for all of our lives um, trying to, uh, to show what we all knew for a long period of time, uh, the, the importance of emergency care and emergency medicine. And you will see that, uh, when we were talking about measures, the definition becomes so important. And you know, my focus has really been uh, what matters to the user, which is emergency care, uh, even though emergency medicine was I do and what I would like to talk about, but emergency care. And that, those are nuances and there's little differences in, in, in those terms. This paper was written for the policymakers and you know, we'll talk about all the issues, uh, and uh, there are many issues with this. Uh, but before I got there, get there, I was asked to talk about my own journey. So I'll take uh, a couple of uh, few slides, uh, share. Let me see if I can share my screen. So um, I am um, from Karachi in Pakistan. I grew up to the, one of the largest cities in the world. Uh, a few years ago, it was the third largest city in the world, 21 million people. Um, it is um, larger than New York and LA combined. It is larger than uh, the state of Maryland where I live, the state of Pennsylvania, next door, Washington DC uh, and uh, part of New York. So uh, a city with um, uh, lots of people, 20,000 people per square uh, kilometer. This is where I went to medical school. Uh, it's a place called Aga Khan University and uh, spent a lot of time there. Uh, I trained in emergency medicine uh, uh, in, in New Haven, uh, a place called Yale. Uh, did my uh, PhD in public health and the focus on uh, as Anissa, similar to Anissa's was uh, looking at emergency care data 
from ambulance services and police record in Karachi. So I spent a lot of time really going through paper-based uh, data and, and understood what the issues were. Um, then I returned back uh, to Pakistan and, and worked with some great colleagues at, at AKU, uh, was, uh, was pushed into uh, being uh, uh, chair of emergency medicine, a new department, and, um, and then uh, had, a, had a really um, amazing opportunity of establishing an EMS system uh, in Karachi. Um, and with that um, came a lot of experiences that we were, you know, we thought we were trained for, but not really trained for it. Uh, and for a couple of years um, uh, while I was running the EMS service and, uh, and also chairing the Department of Emergency Medicine, uh, we had a huge uh, issue of terrorism. On average, we would have a bomb blast every third day. So um, um, it was, um, I won't say it was a great experience. Unfortunately, it was a very painful experience, but we learned a lot uh, and, uh, and were able to still sustain a system uh, despite uh, personal attacks, despite uh, losing uh, some of the colleagues to bombing this little ambulance that was bombed. Um, uh, we also had a you know, telemedicine program, uh, uh, ran a community-based community health program uh, in, uh, in urban uh, squatter settlements, Karachi. Um, and um, also with that, uh, you know, lots of opportunities to uh, grow the program from one resident to, who left uh, when I joined the year I joined uh, uh, because he didn't think emergency medicine was worth it to a uh, uh, pretty large number. And then moving back to uh, US, uh, working at Hopkins, uh, had an opportunity to work at NIH in the US, which is the largest funder of health research. And uh, they were interested in, um, in learning how, why should they invest in emergency care research? The thirty billion dollar investment in health research, and there is there is a department of emergency care research uh, with the so one person department out of thousands of people that work in uh, at NIH. So we, we got a, a bunch of people together. I also had a um, really nice opportunity working at W World, World Health Organization as a WHO collaborating center director, and of course AKU. So lots of very different. Um, experiences, and as we, you know, as a couple of years ago, uh, when I when I used to talk about, uh, I used to present this, uh, and uh, we would uh, talk about uh, how health has changed from an input to prosperity as a necessary um, requirement for prosperity and development, uh, to then becoming sort of central focus of uh, Millennium Development Goals, and now. Sustainable development goal, and then you know uh, we used to talk about uh, health and global security. And I used to make an argument that the reason why emergency care will get uh, a real you know focus will be when the global security will be threatened by an epidemic. Uh, I think we unfortunately it happened before uh, we were expecting, but it is an opportunity to uh, to talk about what we can deliver. Uh, coming to the paper, uh, one of the things that we have always struggled is uh, the fact that you can't manage what you can't measure and, you know, measure what matters and use indicators that make sense. So over, over the years, I've, um, like many of us have published so many papers and realized that people don't, didn't understand when we talked about number of patients coming to the emergency department. Uh, uh, or uh, the, the severity of patients coming in. And the, the question was, can we use the indicators that make sense to the policymakers uh, and, and use them for emergency care? And you know, as, you, as you all know, there are many measures of health status that are globally accepted, uh, life expectancy, uh, mortality, or years of life lost, morbidity, uh, years lived with disability, um, the incidence and prevalences of diseases, and then combination of uh, the Delhi's uh, burden of disease, both years, years lived with disability and years of life lost. So all of that was interesting. Uh, the problem was um, what is um, emergency care and what diseases are emergency care? And we'll, somebody mentioned that. 
And the focus really was that how do we go and talk about uh, uh, having emergency care indicators which can, which can be part of the larger global public health agenda. For example, uh, the disparity between how long you live. Uh, in some countries, you still live 47 years. In others, uh, 83 on average. This is low, very low income, high income country. Uh, or uh, children who die before the age of five. Again, big disparities. And then um, being able to talk about the years of life lost due to um, emergency medical diseases. And the difference is five times and 500% between high and low income countries. That's, uh, 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 that is the kind of purpose of the paper and what we're trying to do. Also, you'll see here, um, of course you can't read, but uh, these are the countries. So we have data on each country and how they perform with the burden of uh, emergency diseases and compare that to the, uh, the income level. And of course, you know, as we expect, uh, lower income countries uh, have a higher burden. Uh, and as you get out uh, of the poverty, the emergency diseases, the exception uh, such as US where because of gun violence, primarily young deaths are happening. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there, there's a lot of um, uh, lessons learned, I think, from that perspective. Now, um, last couple of slides. What's, what are the limitations of the approach that, that you saw? Uh, we focus on emergency diseases and on emergency medicine. And you know, how do you get to emergency diseases? So, uh, one of the main criticism our paper had, and we tried to, we tried to shop it around. I was very excited about this and I couldn't publish it in, in top journals. Even Annals of Emergency Medicine said no. Uh, and the reason was, and they said, you know, we like the concept, but we don't know how you got to emergency diseases. And uh, as you saw the paper, uh, I, I tried not to do it myself. We used the data um, the proposed by someone else. Uh, and they had done uh, a relatively small study where they'd given uh, the list of the global burden of diseases to uh, clinicians and ask them to rank it as emergency diseases, urgent diseases, and non-urgent. And you know there are a lot of urgent diseases that you know people mentioned in this conversation that I took out because I didn't want to have that criticism that you're overestimating because just because you're an emergency doc. So we said we will underestimate, and we will use the information that was produced in some other mechanism. Now you know it was a small sample size, and I think those of you who are interested in the research may want to dig into that because I think there's a really uh, little more work needs to be done on what is an emergency disease and, and, uh, and then be a more, have a more robust definition of that. Um, and then again, uh, how do you define emergency diseases? And then, you know, how much of, of these emergency diseases are amenable to emergency care? So if, if you have a, patient with uh, congestive heart failure, the EF of 20%, and now comes in with decompensated heart failure and dies, you know, how much of that disease is chronic and how much is acute? Uh, um, versus somebody who was walking the street and got hit by a car and now um, has trauma, which uh, is relatively well-defined acute illness. So, you know, that kind of nuances we don't have, and, you, you know, a lot of people I think some more work needs to be done on that. Somebody also mentioned the quality of data in global burden of disease study. Now that is the best we have, but we understand that a lot of that data from especially low middle income countries is a modeling data. So they'll pick up a smaller study and they will you know, uh, apply it to the whole country. So the quality of data, and, and this where I think uh, emergency departments uh, the data systems, uniformity of data collection system, the surveillance systems can play a big role. So we use the global burden disease study, which is currently the gold standard with a lot of uh, limitations. And, uh, and again, we share these indicators, the mortality, years of life lost and disability life years. And I, I was, I struggled a little bit on this. My initial paper, my first draft I submitted was 
only focused on years of life lost. Because I was coming from the perspective that disability has so many other determinants uh, besides what we do in the first hour, but I know we can actually have a lot more impact on mortality than disability. So I wanted to focus on that, but reviewers kept coming back and said, we would like you to come back with disability information as well. So that's been, a, um, and I think a future probably, and we can debate that. Uh, my sense is that for emergency diseases and for emergency care intervention, years of life lost will be a much interesting uh, way to look at and mortality. I think mortality is good. What we've been able to do through this is uh, is that we have something to present. You know, as a as a group, we can say, look, this is what we have today: uh, infant mortality rate, uh, maternal mortality rate. They all have many many uh, limitations, but we have with all these limitations, we have a measure. We can always improve on it. Um, I'm hoping at some point that. Uh, the national, international societies will will own any major, not just this, but define, own some major so we can all speak the same language. Right now, we don't speak the same language. Uh, so uh, so let's stop here and, and uh, take any questions and, and get your feedback. Thank you, Janae. That ties in really well with what we've been speaking about earlier. So I'm wondering whether anyone has some questions straight off the bat and then like before, I just pop something in the chat function and we can pick a few. I think we've got time for a couple before we need to conclude. So if anyone like to start us off, Anissa, I can see you've got a question. Yeah, I was delighted um, to find out that my um, my own journey is not uh, didn't start in dissimilar places to yours, um, Professor Azak. So um, that'll, that'll serve me well for the next few years, I think. Um, it, really interesting just to hear your perspective and also the sort of pushback that you get um, when 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 this work is actually presented. Um, it was kind of it's kind of a comment, kind of a question. Um, because a lot of this work obviously ends up being done by researchers and there's always this big gap between sort of research and practice and very often there's um, a lot of pushback from practitioners that you know, the researchers are you know not really understanding the practice the practitioners the research are not really understanding you know there's that kind of that that issue but there is also that other layer of, of academia that kind of gets gets put on top of that and the, the career academic and, and polishing your research um, to make it fit the career. Um, and as somebody who's obviously, you know, yourself, you, you, you've got an academic career in global emergency medicine, there must have been periods of time, particularly with this peak of piece of work and other work, where you have to put that moral question to yourself. Now, what what is the how am I going to balance up? I need to progress my career to be able to keep doing the work, but I also need to stay very true to the work that's very important. And those two things don't necessarily connect together in the world of getting funding. So it's kind of a comment, kind of a question. And did any of that come up, particularly with this study or any similar studies um, that you, you've dealt with? You know, I've been very lucky. I have been uh, I have practiced uh, and saw patients and did stuff. Uh, in a developing country for most of my life. Uh, Hopkins is, uh, uh, was a detour a little bit. Uh, and when you work in, in a developing country, uh, you are not, you, you can't be just an academic, as we all know. There is, if you are a successful academic, you automatically become a, uh, a very powerful policy uh, voice as well. So uh, I, I find, uh, and, and I think for all, those of us who were early in emergency medicine, we had that flexibility um, that I can play both sides sometimes. Uh, with WHO, I still work with them and uh, enjoyed that work. But uh, when I get too frustrated with the bureaucracy, I can always come back to my computer and start working on my paper. So that's, uh, that's been my journey. And uh, I don't know if it makes sense, uh, but to me, it was been fun. Thank you. I think Sinead, um, not Sinead, your Sinead, Najib has got a question for you as well, Sinead. <laughs> oh, if only, if only. <laughs> um, so a couple of thoughts, and, I, and I, I just wanted to contrast, I guess, our experience in, you know, in the UK or perhaps the US as well. We have lots of electronic medical record systems, which are tied to ICD-10 diagnoses. And, and that's how, you know, we are we are held up in terms of our performance and our business and what we do. And obviously you coming across with 
a definite, you know, trying to describe a definition of mortality and burden for a for a specialty which still isn't very well understood or defined and is actually broad based because you know compare people I think compartmentalize maternal mortality or pediatric mortality under fives. There's a nuance, I think there's a way they can perceive that, but emergency disease burden is a slightly more well, I guess it's potentially quite a lot more difficult. So how how have you navigated that? that contrast between the drive towards electronic medical record systems and ICD-10 coding, which is used then to look at activity versus maybe discussions at WHO policymaker level saying, look, we need a, a defined metric to look at emergency care. And how do we balance those two things? What's been your kind of experience with that? And, and, and then therefore, should it be our objective as global EM practitioners to start adopting you know, which definition should we start looking to measure our impact for programs? Because when we do a maternal health program, you look at maternal mortality. If you do a pediatric health program, you look at child mortality. Should we be looking at emergency disease burden mortality reduction as part of research, QI, educational systems, health system strengthening? Yeah, I gave up a long time ago um, fighting the diagnosis battle because uh, we really don't often make a diagnosis in the emergency department. What I tried to do is, I said, you know, I don't care about diagnosis, I care about intervention. And the intervention is the emergency care system. So what can we do within emergency care system if I can just ignore the diagnosis and say, well, these are the diseases uh, that we could potentially help with a system that is essentially a chain of survival. Uh, and, and the other thing that I did was I said, I don't, while I work in the emergency department, my definition of emergency care is where the patient is. So it is irrespective of what part of the healthcare system uh, we're talking about, the patient's at home, that is for me emergency care system and that needs to be taken care of. Uh, diagnosis, as you know, a lot of these systems, at least in the U on the US side, were built for billing and for you know, epidemiological purposes not for health system purposes. So that's where the, the struggle is. And uh, often people don't understand where we come from. I think what we're saying that if you improve, if you strengthen your emergency care system, you could potentially impact 50% of your uh, disease burden. And even if you are successful 10% of time, you're actually have such a huge return on investment that nothing else will do, you know? So that, that's, that's the approach, system versus diagnosis. So that makes sense. And and have you have you uh, do you know of either you and your teams or other teams that have used your concepts as part of um, you know programmatic change or interventional change at health system strengthening level? Or is that is that kind of where the next space needs to be? I think that's where the next steps need to be. I think the uh, the emergency medicine world needs to accept the fact that we need to have a measure. I remember as a, as a young researcher, you know, I will often discuss things and senior people will say, you know, not everything that matters is measured. And I, I for a long time believed that. But now I feel like, no, I think we need to measure it. And we need to say, well, let's measure, even if it is not the best measure, let's take something and own it, improve it, and then use the same language. And emergency medicine at this right now is not there, I feel. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Thanks very much, Sinead. Is there anyone else like to ask something? And we've got two more questions. I think, do we have time for that? I reckon we probably do. Um, so Jess, if you'd like to go first and then we'll finish up with um, Shweta, so you'd like to say something as well. Hi, I just want to say thank you so much, Sinead. That was really interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask, as far as you're aware, because I feel like your discussion really addressed that there was so many, like several factors that really um, kind of affect burden. And there's been a social services side, patient literacy. I feel like you covered everything. And I just wasn't sure whether you felt like, since there seems to be a beginning for researchers to work from, have you known of anyone kind of springboarding off your work and um, of defining this as a metric? And, and there's a, is there any ongoing research at the moment that you're aware of? Uh, I'm not aware of it, and I. Um, what we are trying to do, and you know, please let me know if you're interested, is uh, to have a website where we start putting these yearly changes in the burden of emergency diseases, and use that as 
sort of non-academic approach, more public health approach to to this to to dissemination. But right now, I don't. I'm not aware of anybody. Thank you, and Shweta. Hi, sorry, apologies, I don't have my camera on. Again, I've got uh, kind of kids and various other things in the background that you probably don't want to be invited to this meeting. So thank you very much for uh, the presentation and your conversation about the paper and the sort of um, thoughts behind the paper. That's really helpful to hear. Um, I guess with your kind of policy hat um, as part of uh, collaboration with WHO, I wondered whether you'd had some conversations about uh, using these kind of matrices because it completely, you know, resonates with me, and I agree with you. Having kind of common denominators um, to define and measure, and therefore use them as levers for change at a kind of, you know, government level, health ministry kind of level, um, is really, really helpful. And that's kind of where WHO plays, plays a strong kind of role. And I think, you know, like, you know, Terry's really done an amazing work in in, in pushing this mantra that emergency health care systems are central to all of those indicators that all these countries report to. So I guess the question was whether there is, uh, you know, some conversation and movement in that direction. Um, and, I, and the second sort of add on question was really about using these same, same matrices in high income countries and whether there's any value, for example, our health system in the UK. Yeah, uh, so there have been a, for a long period of time at WHO, has been interested in that conversation. And I think they would come to some sort of metrics for emergency care soon after what's going on these days. Um, what I've tried to do is to talk to American College of Emergency Physicians, because you know, if you, ASAP has a report card and they publish this report card for every state and it's really poorly done. And, uh, uh, but, uh, for, I think for many of these organizations, there's a lot of politics. It's not very simple, as you, as you probably know. Um, the conversation is not uh, evidence-based. So I think there is an underlying current of conversation, uh, but uh, there's not enough pressure on these organizations to have measures uh, that are accepted across the board. One of the other th thoughts I will just share with you is, if you look at, the success of certain global public health um, interventions, HIV, for example, you know, took um, was a huge problem, but had a major intervention globally from from governments. Uh, why did that happen? Uh, that happened because there was a community around HIV that was not just physicians, ID physicians. It just became a, a really public health. Uh, bandwagon and everybody was on it and everybody was talking about it because there were young people who were dying on from it. Uh, uh, for emergency medicine, we have not created uh, the group that is outside of emergency medicine talk about emergency care. Uh, if for trauma as well, there are very few people now, you know, they're uh, mothers against um, uh, drunk driving. There are few, uh, few civil society groups that have done it. But for emergency medicine, we have not really been able to successfully launch that. If we had that group, then governments, large organizations, WHO will be much more interested than what they are now. Thank you, Denise. Um, might have to tie up there, I'm afraid. I don't know um, about everyone else, but like Najib says in the chat function, certainly I'm feeling inspired. And I think this conversation could go on for a lot longer, but we have to stop at one point, unfortunately, and I wish it wasn't right now. But um, just a massive thank you for joining us and making time in your day for us. Um, and also a massive thank you to um, Jess for her presentation and also everyone in sort of the sidelines that have helped to make today as well. Um, just to go on to our final slide, um, if you'd like to know more about Gecko and this is the first time you've attended one of our events, then please follow our Twitter handle and head over to our website because there's lots of interesting things going on there. Um, this is actually the first part of four classroom style events and it will second will follow in similar format to this evening's. So the presentation followed by a paper discussion followed by a speaker. Um, and the next session will be on emergency care systems in global settings. So we certainly hope to see you there. Um, before everyone disappears, 
we would be really grateful if you could follow the QR code that's on your screen now. But there's also a link in the chat to function to a short feedback survey. If you wouldn't mind just spending 30 seconds to complete this, it really helps shape our future events and, and sort of hear what, what you would like from us as well. And finally, just thank you everyone for attending. It's been a really interesting evening. I'm sure you can all agree. And thank you everyone again. Good night. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for hosting. Take care now. Bye-bye.